Hey everybody, Charles Hoskinson here. I figured I'd make a video, a nice one of those whiteboard videos. I love making them. And let's talk a little bit about decentralization. So I uh, I heard through the grapevine that old Jimmy Song and uh, Tone Vays were picking on Cardano. And generally I don't reply to Tone. This is really not a rebuttal or a reply to him uh, because what's the point? I mean, uh, you can't really beat stupidity with facts. You just uh, you just let it move on. In fact, there was an old saying, uh, you never play chess with a pigeon because they'll just strut over the board, knocking over the pieces, triumphantly shitting. And that's exactly what this is about. Uh, they brought up something about how to centralize this Cardano and called us a little crazy for having the audacity to even think about it. And there's this concept of decentralization. Nice, big, thick pen. Okay. And it's a, it's a worthwhile concept to really consider and think about. It's worthwhile to really wrap your mind around it. You see, Bitcoin has this model called proof of work. And proof of work is a meritocratic lottery system. So basically you have a miner and a miner is sitting there all day long and it's computing uh, basically magic numbers. It's looking for uh, a certain number like a ticket to basically win. So it's going to go compute and do hash one and hash two. And every second it's able to compute a set of potential tickets to win. And eventually a miter gets lucky. And one of those turns out to be a winning set. And then this gives the miner the right to advance Bitcoin. Now, the system is parameterized in a way where uh, this happens hopefully every approximately 10 minutes, and the difficulty increases over time as more people participate. And more people have an incentive to participate as the price of Bitcoin goes up. So you look at price, Difficulty goes up as price goes up. So here's difficulty. Okay. And price. So basically how hard it is to find these magic numbers is directly connected to price because as price goes up, more competition occurs, more competition occurs, uh, more difficulty to get, ensure that we make Bitcoins basically every 10 minutes. Okay. And uh, if you actually, sure enough, look at the difficulty graphs of Bitcoin, you can see that relationship on uh, Bitcoin.info or any of your other providers where you can look at the price of Bitcoin, the energy consumption and the um, difficulty. There's a very nice tight correlation there that shows those things. Now, here's the problem. As difficulty goes up, proof of work gets more centralized. And this is unavoidable. Okay, so why does it get more centralized? Well, you have to go from CPUs. So those are processors, general processors that live in your computer, my computer, to increasingly more specialized hardware. So anybody can buy a CPU. Your price of admission is very low there. That's Intel, AMD, ARM, etc. Anybody can buy a GPU, okay? That's NVIDIA, AMD, and they're in pretty good circulation. But then when you start getting to increasingly more specialized things like FPGAs or ASICs, in fact, when I made my first videos on Bitcoin, we were moving from GPUs to FPGAs. That was a big transition back in 2013. And there were already people building ASICs, application-specific integrated circuits. These are custom. And in many cases, they're patented. And in many cases, they're owned by private companies. Okay. And guess what? They don't have to sell these to you. If it's patented, you can't make it. If it's a private company, the private company doesn't have to sell it to you. And given that it's custom, what does it mean? The supply chain of these things is very, very tight. Okay. So... 
if these are the only devices that you can use to mine, then you tell me, is the fact that somebody gets the right to decide who gets it open or closed? Somehow the Bitcoin people, they, they just have so much difficulty with this topic. The other thing is that your ability to profit, to make money on Bitcoin mining is directly connected to not only your access to ASICs, Okay, that's one, but it's also connected to your price of electricity, price of power. All right, well, hang on a second here. What if you live in a country with very expensive electricity? What if you live in a country where you have political connections, you get free power or inexpensive power? So based on geography and political connections, your price of power may vary. So how is that fair for people who don't live in countries with subsidized power or very expensive, or they live in countries with very expensive power? So we already have two factors that limit access to mining. Okay, two factors that limit access to mining geographically and also one in the supply chain. So the other thing is because there can only be one winner. And if there are multiple winners, there's a competition between them. And one of the blocks ends up being an orphan block. You then have a situation where it tends towards economy of scale. Okay. So what does that mean? Economy of scale it means that the larger actors tend to do better. They can optimize things. They can build better data centers. They can have better network access. And so your ticket of admission is now greater than $100 million worth of hardware. Okay. You could certainly run a small-scale ASIC mining operation, but you're not going to make a lot of money, especially if there are delays in the ASIC supply chain, because if you get older generation ASICs, your margins will be substantially impacted. So the people who are making real money, who have real power, those are people who have invested greater than $100 million into their mining operations. Huge ticket price to entry because of economy of scale. These people do very good, and people who aren't them really don't make a lot for the ASIC mining side of things on Bitcoin. Okay, Not to say you can't make some money and participate but if you want to run a business, a professional opportunity, there's a huge bias towards the rich. Okay. So Bitcoin, you need ASICs. You need subsidized power. You also benefit substantially for economy of scale. And there's a huge bias towards the rich and you need a big chunk of money to be able to participate, which is why if you look at every single year, 2009, 2010, since the event of ethics, 2011, 2012, dot, 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 all the way to 2020, you know what's happened? There's an increasingly smaller supply of major mining operations to a point where approximately 10 Ops, run the show. Okay. So 10 big actors, less than 10 big actors, control more than 51% of the resource. So you have guys like Jimmy and uh, Tone. They run around and tell you Bitcoin is the best thing in the whole wide world. Mining is the only way to truth. By the way, can you participate? Well, Bitcoin's so decentralized. It's so decentralized. And you say, well, the people who maintain the system, they live outside of the system. They are consuming a custom resource that's patented in private. It benefits tremendously from the price of electricity. And they got to have a lot of money to be able to play and participate. That doesn't sound to me like a decentralized system. And lo and behold, over time, you get increasingly more federated. Wow, look at that. That's the reality we live in right now. Now, let's look at proof of stake. Proof of stake needs a resource too. 
Okay. Our resource isn't an ASIC. Our resource is the underlying token, ADA. All right. Let's look at this. Do you need subsidized electricity for proof of stake? No, you don't. Regardless of the price of electricity, you can still stake. Do you need access to proprietary, private, and patented hardware to be able to participate? No, you just need to be able to purchase ADA, which seems to me to be kind of like the CPUs or the GPUs, right? It lives on every exchange. Anybody can purchase that. Okay. Does this benefit from economy of scale? Not really. The way that we designed the protocol after a certain hump, it profits pretty much the same. It scales linearly in that respect. Okay, so you don't need $100 million worth of ADA to be able to participate in the system. Do you need to live in a certain geography to be able to have an advantage over others? No, it's egalitarian in that particular respect. Okay, so no geographic restrictions. Okay, no patents, open access to resource, and the poor can participate. And they say, but Charles, does the network get more centralized or less centralized over time? Well, let's look at that. Okay, so as the price of ADA goes up. So as we increase the price, you know what happens? That K factor for the amount of stake pools goes up too. K increases. Why? Because it's easy to increase K uh, to, to make more profit for people when you have a higher value token. And we can model that. We published a bunch of blog posts that can show this relationship. So over time, as ADA grows in adoption, because it's a finite resource, it becomes more scarce. As you get more users and utility inside the system, the price goes up. If the price goes up, the K factor, which is our optimal amount of stake pools in the system, increases. What does that mean? It means that the system has more participants at the staking level actually making blocks. This is the inverse relationship of Bitcoin. When we go to Bitcoin, we say, as the price goes up, the difficulty goes up, the difficulty goes up. You have more economy of scale towards the rich and those who have subsidized power and those who have first access to the ASICs win. So you end up having fewer and fewer and fewer people participating on the consensus level, less and less people like you, everyday people and more and more millionaires and billionaires with vertically integrated, sophisticated operations and powerful data centers and so forth. This is not the case for the system we've constructed here. You have an open resource that's always going to be available. There's always going to be sellers floating around who are exiting and entering because markets exist. It does not yield geographic restrictions. There's no patents. There's no restrictions in that supply chain. You have open access to the resource as a consequence of liquid markets. The poor can participate just as much as the rich can. And as the price goes up, the K factor gets larger. The system gets more participation. Then to Jimmy's argument that it's just a signature, there's no security. I guess he just doesn't understand anything we've done in any of our papers. I would encourage him to start by reading the GKL paper and then telling us what's wrong with that model. I would encourage him to read the Ouroboros classic paper and tell us what's wrong with that model, where that doesn't make any sense. He says there's no security at all. It's, it's nothing, it's a paperweight, it's like paper clothing. Uh, it doesn't provide you anything. It's like, guys, then explain what's wrong with the security proofs. You can't roll it back. You have finality over time. Uh, you, you you can bootstrap from Genesis, just like Bitcoin can. The operating environment is a semi-synchronous environment, just like Bitcoin's environment happens to be. You know, there's detailed and meticulous security proofs about why this system works and why the state of the system uh, is secure. And it has the same level of security in terms of Byzantine resistance that Bitcoin does. Uh, and so as long as you assume that no more than... 50% plus one of the uh, holdings of ADA are in the hands of honest actors 
which, by the way, have a financial incentive for the system to behave correctly, uh, the system is secure. Miners do not have a financial incentive. An attack that Bitcoin can suffer from is let's assume that there are two chains, proof of work one and proof of work two. Because they have a shared security resource, if these two chains achieve the same price or relatively the same price, then assuming markets exist, if you have enough of that security resource, you actually have an incentive to destroy one of the chains. Why? Because you can make just as much money mining chain two as you can make mining chain one. So since you have this shared resource, if you destroy chain one and short sell it, okay, you basically get downside. You'll make a windfall profit from the destruction of that chain. Then you turn all your resources over to chain two, and there's no interruption in your mining profit. So you make windfall from destroying one system, and then you're mining another system. Why? It's an external resource. It's not connected to the token price at all. So there's no vested interest in the resource to protecting the very thing that they're protecting. You're paying them to do that. It's mercenary behavior in that respect. Whereas in a proof of stake system, your ADA only works with Cardano. Your EOS tokens only work with EOS. Your Tezos tokens only work with Tezos. Your F2 tokens will only work with Ethereum 2. And if there's a massive decline in price, there's no way to get out of that. You are stuck in that system. So you'd like that system to be secure and resilient. Your financial interest is directly connected to the price of the token and the security and stability of the system. This is not the case with mining. You can do a gold finger attack at any time. Throughout the years, there's also been things identified like selfish mining. You should look that one up. And a litany of other game theoretic attacks that exist in the mining world. It's not a perfect consensus algorithm. There are ways to improve it and make it better and mitigate these things. But it is absolutely disingenuous to say Bitcoin style mining, which is ASIC heavy, is the end-all be-all and the only way to provide security. With Genesis, we got bootstrap from Genesis. And we have another paper coming out to give us the ability to recover from spikes of dishonest majority. We've already achieved the same synchronization model, and we have the same security threshold as Bitcoin now. We detailed all of this in beautiful papers that we wrote. And just to give you guys a sense of these papers, let's show you. Okay. If you type in GKL15, right here, the Bitcoin Backbone Protocol cited 853 times. You'll see that it's been relentlessly updated. It came out in 2015. We keep updating the paper because it's that useful. We give a very rigorous examination of what Bitcoin is, what blockchains are. We talk about the security model. And we give strong definitions. Now, I'd love for Jimmy to go through this paper and tell us where these definitions are wrong, where these proofs are wrong, where this model is wrong, because this is a rigorous mathematical model to describe how this stuff works. OK, now, once you have the model, then you can talk about security precisely and you can create security proofs. So if you go ahead and Google Ouroboros, classic Agalos print okay here is the original Ouroboros paper that we wrote we revised it in july of 2019 we exhaustive rewriting of this paper 67 pages long this is the foundations for Ouroboros the protocol that we use and again it talks about the prior work that's been done it talks about the challenges in designing a proof of stake protocol it talks about persistence and liveness all the typical things that you'd like to have in a consensus protocol. Talks about time and synchrony. Talks about how the ledger works. And here are the three properties from the GKL paper, the common prefix with parameter, the honest chain growth, and the existential chain quality with parameters. Okay. 
And then we rigorously go inside the paper, step by step by step, explaining why the protocol is secure. Then, what did we do? We wrote another paper called Ouroboros Preos. Here, we said it's not just good enough to create a synchronized protocol. We need a protocol with adaptive security. We need a protocol that behaves in realistic network conditions. So we modeled it in a fully adaptive corruption and semi-synchronous setting. Okay, going down here, you can clearly see all the work here. And we're actually rewriting this paper to modernize it because there's a whole bunch we've learned since 2017. Are we done yet? No, then we wrote this paper, Ouroboros Genesis. Okay, and sure enough, look at this right here. The key thing that Bitcoin provides, the beautiful thing that Bitcoin provides is the ability to bootstrap from Genesis. So what does that mean? It means that if you're a Bitcoin user and you've never used the system before and you have a whole bunch of chains, candidates that are provided to you, you are actually able to do a calculation, okay? You run that calculation with each chain you've been given and you'll be able to weigh them. Whichever one has the most work, that's the winner. And then you say, okay, that's the real one. It's a great property, okay? You have no knowledge of the system. You just do a calculation and you're able to determine chains from each other and get rid of the ones that are less work. Okay, so determinism and chain selection. We accomplished that here in this paper with Proof of Stake. It was the first of its kind, and it was reviewed at a great conference, CCS, which was one of the most prestigious cryptographic conferences, not cryptocurrency, cryptographic conferences in the world. Back in 2018, I believe, is uh, when we got to CCS, or 2019, I can't remember. So anyway, uh, it was CCS and Ouroboros Genesis. And there are more papers coming out from here, like we had to play with the clock. So we created Ouroboros Chronos. Here, we didn't like relying upon a clock-like NTP. So we said, hey, let's go ahead and create clock synchronization via proof of stake. Let's go do that. This is another revolutionary paper for its time. We also wanted to model the relationship between a permissioned and permissionless. So we created a BFT variant of Ouroboros. Okay. So we did the work. Every single day, our scientists woke up for year after year after year, and they wrote these papers. And by the way, these papers are not just our own results, but if you look at, for example, Ouroboros Genesis, it's cited 87 times. Some by papers we wrote, a lot by papers we didn't wrote, right, from other systems, other protocols, in many cases, our competitors. Okay, so here's Preos. That's been cited 150 times by many, many other people all across the world, China, America, so forth. If you look at the Ouroboros Classic paper, that has been cited now 657 times all across the world. Cornell University, Ido Bentov, David, look at all these people. Across the world, blockchain without waste, proof of stake, Thunderella, sleepy model of consensus, all across the world. Hundreds of different scientists that we have. That is work, proof of work right there, proof of scientific work. You have created something, it passed the rigors of peer review. People from MIT on down have cited your work year after year after year. You've rigorously told people what you're going to do. You've modeled the security assumptions and you achieve the security properties that they care about. Okay, now is proof of stake perfect? No, there are still many little things here and there and systematically we're working our way through to resolve those edge cases as is Algorand and as all the other science coins doing that. Is proof of work perfect? Absolutely not. It has very real and meaningful problems as stated above. And guess what? These problems are not resolvable with science. You can't change the fact that proof of work tends towards these ASICs for the way that Bitcoin has implemented it. 
Bitcoin's not going to change. They've accepted that ASICs are fine. And over time, access to them will not become commoditized. It'll become increasingly more specialized to a point where these companies don't even bother to sell them. You can't change the cost of power and that some company, countries have cheaper electricity than others. And also you can't change the fact that as the price goes up, difficulty goes up and it creates a larger and larger economy of scale, which makes a smaller and smaller set of participants in the system. Okay, and the proof of stake system, if the price goes up, more people divest, the markets get stronger at any given time, that resource will always be available in some capacity. So you get more and more equal access. And we modeled how we can increase the K factor with price. So as the token gets more valuable, there's more profit for the stake pool operators. So you can increase K factor to get more diversity in the stake pool operators, which means you get more and more and more and more stake pools. So you go from 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 and so forth. So if the system is worth the same as Bitcoin, it'll be thousands of times more decentralized in that respect. And decentralized means real human beings, small businesses are running a node and making blocks. By the way, because of this two layer model where you have the regular everyday user and then you have the stake pool operator, what does that mean? It means that you have a trusted layer in the system to deploy layer two solutions. They always ask, where are we gonna get the lightning channels from? Where are we gonna get oracles from? Where are we gonna get cross-chain interoperability from? <gasps> well, we have a special class of small business act operators who are in our system we trust to make blocks for us. That's in getting increasingly more diverse and has an incentive to watch each other and compete with each other. Well, that means that over time, those SPOs will add more services to the system. Okay, and what does that mean? It means there's more use and utility for the system and more profit for the SPOs. So we have an incentive to increase the use and utility by increasing the diversity of stake pool operators because they're trusted actors, because they've pledged amounts and they have brand and reputation inside the system. And if they're caught doing bad things, they lose the stake that's delegated to them and they kind of get kicked out of the system in that respect. You basically can use them as a stable set of actors to do things, whether it be generating random numbers or providing timestamps or Oracle services, et cetera, et cetera. And the system can be run anywhere. Let's say China bans Bitcoin tomorrow, okay? Because they keep doing that. These all those miners in China, what the hell do they do? If you have a hundred million dollar facility, maybe the government takes it over. Maybe they just throw them all into a warehouse and then the hash power goes down dramatically. Well, with a system like this, if your country passes laws that says running a stake pool is illegal, what you do is you just incorporate abroad in a different country. And then you just run the stake pools under that legal structure. So let's say Germany has bad laws. Maybe you go to Switzerland or Liechtenstein or somewhere else. And because it's a virtual resource, at a click of the button, it can be moved from one country to another country at a click of a button. You cannot do that with a physical resource. And oh, by the way, that physical resource has bizarre game theoretic things where you can do selfish mining Goldfinger attacks as well. So it's just laughable. It's absolutely laughable when I see these, these insane videos come out from these maximalists where they just pretend this is the end all be all. Our system is 1.6 million times more energy efficient than Bitcoin at the moment. 1.6 million times. And if their continuing success means that we only get more optimized, by the way, we have an incentive to reduce the energy consumption because that energy consumption has nothing to do with your performance as a stake pool operator. So the cheaper hardware that you can use, the more energy efficient hardware you can use to do the same job, the better for you in your bottom line. So your incentive for energy consumption per user is getting lower over time. In Bitcoin, anytime you have an energy gain, you buy more miners. So you can generate more magic numbers to find that winning lottery ticket to advance the network. So it has the opposite effect. Any energy gain means more purchase of hardware, more miners are brought into this way, not a reduction of power. That's just the economics of the system as it is. They can't seem to understand the papers. They don't even want to read them or discuss them or talk about what areas could improve or what assumptions we've made are unrealistic 
or how our security model is wrong. The people who do care are professional cryptographers from across the world, and we know they kind of like what we do because they cite our papers and they use them as foundations for their own papers. So that's decentralization of control. Notice they never even talked about decentralization of the network layer of the system, and Bitcoin is a very primitive network stack. And as a consequence, there's all kinds of shenanigans and chicanery that can be done there. Notice they never talk about decentralization of development or decision-making inside the system. So what if the people who make decisions of what goes into the core protocol aren't willing to entertain certain ideas? Then they censor you. And how do you as a holder of that token have a voice and be able to vote on it? We have an on-chain governance system. That same virtual resource that gives you a voice and how the system is going to make blocks and advance itself also gives you a voice on how the system is going to evolve. You have none of that with Bitcoin, but apparently they're more decentralized. So as I often say, think for yourself and incentives matter. They really do. If your system has the wrong economic incentives, you don't get more decentralized over time, you get less decentralized. If you have the wrong incentives, you start handing power to a certain group of people and you can't get it back. If you have the right incentives, the system will self-evolve into the state that you want. We built Cardano with the goal of it being the world financial operating system. We built it to be as inclusive as possible and give economic identity to billions of people which means that billions of people have to have a voice in it and billions of people have to be able to control and influence it in some way. Not 25 people, 10 businesses, or uh, a handful of hardware manufacturers who basically get to decide who gets what where. Okay, so think for yourself. And finally, trust the scientific method. This is the single most important part of all of it. The scientific method does not care if you're a woman or a man, doesn't care what country you're born in, the color of your skin, it doesn't care if you're rich or poor. It absolutely doesn't. It's a process, and it's a process to get rid of bad thoughts and help you converge to good thoughts. We didn't start out and say proof of stake was great. The very first paper that was written was a formalization of what was learned from Bitcoin and what it brought to space because then that was the basis, the standard to achieve if we wanted to build a competing protocol with better properties. We didn't just say that we had invented a protocol that had these properties. We wrote papers, those papers were submitted to conferences. The scientific community took a look at them, criticized them, critiqued them, suggested changes. And over a period of five years, five years of back and forth and argumentation and thought process, we gradually converged to a system that we thought was better. And you know what? The scientific method is the most beautiful world method in the world for criticism because everyone is paid to be a skeptic, but a structured skeptic, not skeptical in a sense of, well, I just don't think it works. Skeptical in that you have every right to criticize anything you want, with a counter argument. You can't just say, I don't know. You say, well, here's why I think it doesn't work. Here's a counter example. Here's a flaw in your thinking or a question about your proof. It's a process. And the more you run that process, the stronger the ideas get, the more accepted the ideas get, and eventually you can build them on granite. So think for yourself, do your own diligence. Incentives absolutely do matter and really think carefully about the incentives that Bitcoin currently has and trust the scientific method. Of course, be skeptical, but if you're going to be skeptical, then be very specific. If you see somebody say, it's just a scam, it's a scam. Okay, great. Then tell us where the scam is. And if they're selling you something that obviously has defects about it and they profit from it, maybe there's an issue there. They have to be structured in their criticism. You have to be a structured cynic. If Tone or Jimmy had specific criticism about the design model, the economic model, the incentives trade-offs that we had, then you know what? This would be a very different whiteboard. Instead, it's proof of work is God.
There is no other way of doing anything. Distributed systems doesn't exist. Byzantine resistance doesn't exist. Uh, Leslie Lamport never invented anything in his entire life. Paxos was never invented. There is only one way to secure a system. Okay. And the only gospel and incentives that matter came from Satoshi 10 years ago. And no, no burden of proof matters. No matter papers we write matter. Not once. Uh, any argument we make they're so illegitimate, we can't even dignify them by discussing them. You know, Jimmy is a smart guy. I assume he has the capacity to open up our papers and read them line by line, live stream, and tell you guys where he has an issue. Walk right through the proofs and first tell me which proofs are wrong or tell me which assumptions are wrong or what weaknesses and trade-offs are there. That's a very productive video. Our scientists would love that gives us something to talk about, gives us something to think about. And maybe Jimmy has something there. I'd love to see the Blockstream guys do it. Adam Back certainly has that capability. But, you know, they don't do it. Why? Because deep down inside, they kind of know that we won this fight. They really do. This was a bootstrap protocol. It started everything. It established the PKI. It established the industry. It was a distribution mechanism for tokens. You have to prime the pump. You have to start somewhere. It was a brilliant bootstrap mechanism. But assuming this exists and you have the cryptocurrency economy, you can then move on to more elegant, refined, energy efficient, sustainable protocols. They're stuck in the past because they own the past and they don't really want people to come in and compete with them that things that are 1.6 million times more energy efficient will always get cheaper to operate and always get more decentralized. And also this layer two thing scares the hell out of them because that's truly decentralized. And their business model, if Bitcoin is working, is to be for-profit private companies that live in the orange. Okay, that's their business model. They don't like the stake pool operators. Why? Because they're being replaced by them. And they're being replaced at a much lower scale. You don't need $100 million of funding from Silicon Valley to start your own block stream. You can be a single mom in Georgia. You can be stay-at-home mom in Wyoming and do the exact same thing on a Raspberry Pi. That's what we've built here. So until next time, y'all have a nice day. And I'd love the rebuttal. Cheers.